Thank you, Tracy. Well, that's quite a picture, isn't it? And we, we know that Revelation is a book that's made up of pictures and symbols, and so that shouldn't surprise us. But this morning, I want to start uh, by asking you a question, and the question is this. What is the most often asked question of all time? It's a one-word answer. Why? Who said that? There you go. Why? You know, you ever have kids? What are you doing? And you tell them, well, why? 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 All the time, isn't it? Uh, we ask the question ourselves. Why is this happening? Why is that happening? Uh, often we look, we look around and we see uh, uh, bad things happening and we say, why? We know God is good. We know God is all-powerful. We know that uh, he could keep anything bad from happening to us, but he doesn't. And what do we say? We say, why? Because that's what we would do. Is that not true? If we had it in our power to keep all harm from coming to our loved ones, wouldn't we do that? Of course we would. So why does not God do that with us? Why do we ask this question? Why is it, uh, we just sang the song, it's been around forever because I sang it when I was a little kid, you know, trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. But we do not. We ask why. We want an explanation. We want God to send us a memo and uh, explain his actions to us. And that's not unique to us. It's all through the ages. Humanity has asked that question. Remember uh, our friend Job. And uh, the, the question he asked God over and over in his book was why? And what did God respond with? Silence. He never told Job why. Job didn't need to know why. Job simply needed to trust in Jesus. Same thing we need today. But it's difficult for us to do. Because we want to make sense out of things. We want things to work the way we think they ought to work. There was a, a book published in, in 1981 a guy by the name of, of a Jew, Rabbi uh, Harold Krishner. And uh, the title of the book was, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? And you may remember it. It made a big splash. It was a bestseller. And I read the book. And uh, he presumed to answer that question, but he did not. And if you've read the book, you come away just as frustrated as when you started. He, he kind of proposes some answers, but none of them really hold water. But why do good things happen, or bad things happen to good people? I don't know. Uh, Dennis Johnson, in his uh, great commentary on the book of Revelation, says this in response to that question. It says, The suffering and tempted church is confronted with a similar set of conundrums as we seek explanations for our experience and the ways of our God in the world. Why must the martyrs wait for vindication? Remember back in chapter 6 when the martyrs cried out, How long, O Lord? He didn't tell them how long, did he? Mm, he just said, wait. Why must the church endure social ostracism, economic sanctions, and imprisonment? Why do the congregations that are in Jesus' hand exhibit such a mixture of truth and error, purity and compromise, love and indifference? Why do wars, fires, and famine rage if the Prince of Peace has taken his throne and has taken in hand God's plan of the ages to carry it out until the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our Lord? Explanations that focus on human combatants are true enough at one level. But what lies behind the hostility of human enemies? What about societal structures and systems of thought? And behind human societies, religions and philosophies, is there a cause of the cosmic conflict that lies behind the various proximate causes? It's an eternal question. We know that the church has always been under attack. The church has always irritated people. And when I say the church, I'm talking about God's people. Not buildings, not denominations, but all of God's people. Why has society, in general, 
always had such enmity toward Christianity. It's a very simple thing for you to discover for yourselves if you want to test it. But sit down in a coffee shop or wherever you like and bring up the subject of Islam. And, and people may say we have the, the radicals are mean and that, but it, they, they really won't get all that upset about Islam. Bring up the subject of Hinduism, Buddhism, uh, atheism, whatever you want to bring up, and people will discuss it on a more or less congenial level. But bring up Christianity and Jesus Christ, and it changes. People don't want to hear it. Why is that? Why is that? Well, you know what? We're going to get the answer this morning. God's going to tell us why that is. And it's right here for us in this 12th chapter of the book of Revelation. But let me set the stage for you. We ask that question, but we should not have to ask that question. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because what did Jesus say about living in this world? He said, in this world you will have tribulation. Now if Jesus himself said that, I think we can expect to have some hard times. In this world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. It's kind of a conundrum there, isn't it? Well, if we're going to have tribulation, if he loves us, if he's in control, and he's overcome, how come? We will see. Paul, in Romans chapter 8, verse 36, says it this way. For your sake, Christ, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered first century Christianity. That's the way it was. Now remember this book, Revelation, is written to seven real existing first century churches. And John himself, in the opening chapter of the book, in the ninth verse, how does he describe himself? Your brother and partner in the tribulation. It's very real. It was going on then. It's going on now. It's not something that's going to happen down the line. The tribulation is the time between the first and second comings of Jesus Christ. Okay? And if we live in that time, and we do, we will have tribulation. Why? Well, the answer is given to us in three parts. And they differ only in perspective. You remember now, when we went through the, the 11th chapter, when we got to the end of it, we had come to the end of time. And now we're going to go back to the beginning of time and see it through to the end twice in just a few short verses. We're going to see the, the whole pageant played out from the creation to the second coming of Christ in just a few short chapters from two perspectives. One from an earthly perspective and one from a heavenly perspective. So stay with me and I think you will find this fascinating. It, it's really pageantry at its best. Portraying the life and death struggle between Satan and God's people. And the first thing we want to look at is what Tracy read for us. The interplay between the woman and the dragon. Man, where's Steven Spielberg? <laughs> you know, what a movie this would make. I mean, you, you've got everything here. The pageantry, the woman, the pregnant woman, the evil dragon, stars cast out of heaven, a, a child caught up to heaven. Let's see if we can sort it all out. The entire chapter now, remember, chapter 12, is dominated by the great conflict between who? The woman and the dragon. The woman and the dragon. We, we have to change some of our thinking here if we're going to get this right. Because we often fall into the trap of thinking that there's a great war going on between Satan and who? God. No, there is not. The war is between Satan and God's people. Because if it were a match between Satan and God, there'd be no war. 
God would just snuff him out and that would be the end of him. Now, that kind of begs the other question, well, why does God let this war go on? I don't know. That's his business. We'll know one day. But I don't know. But the war, remember now, is between Satan and his people. In our opening scene, we see the dragon. Now, here's this big, ugly dragon. And he's, he's waiting to consume the son to whom this woman is about to give birth. Now, it can't get much more horrific than that, can it? You picture that in your mind. And, and think about it. Think about it from the woman's perspective. Uh, you know, and, and you gals will have a better handle on this than I, I will because you guys are the ones that give birth. Think about how horrific it would be for you to be pregnant and have this dragon or whatever it is there waiting to consume your child. So, I can't think of any greater horror than that. And that's the kind of picture John is painting for us here. It's awful. And, because we're Americans, we don't really grasp it, but in the centuries between Christ's first coming and now, if you lived in the wrong parts of the world, that's the horrific reality you would live with. There are, are Christians now, you, you, you hear it on the television, or well, read it in the news, you know, they suffer horrific deaths simply because of Jesus Christ. There's one I, on, the, on the news here just recently, uh, a woman, a young woman, beautiful woman, they had her picture on there, and uh, they're going to give her a hundred lashes and then stone her to death because she married a Christian. That's reality. That's going on in the world right now. We just happen to be insulated from it. This tribulation period is, is not a comfortable thing. So let's identify these three. I, I think we've, we've already pretty much done that. But we see the child in verse 5. And who is, it, who is the child be? The child is representative of Jesus Christ. Satan tried to destroy Jesus Christ, didn't he? When he was here on earth. When Jesus was born, what did Herod do? He had all the babies killed that were born in Bethlehem within a three-year period of time, hoping to kill Jesus. Now you say, well, that was Herod, and Herod was this deranged, crazed maniac, and he was. He's the proximate cause, but what's the cause behind the proximate cause? It's that old adversary, Satan. Jesus is a child. The dragon is easy. It's a Satan. But if you look over at verse 9, this will become a little more pertinent later on. It, it gives another name, and it says, The great dragon was thrown down that ancient, what? Serpent. Oh, where have we seen the serpent before? Of course. In the Garden of Eden. Huh? He showed up, didn't he? Yeah. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute. So, the child and Satan are pretty easy. So who's the woman? Oh, we say it's Mary. No. No. The woman is God's people. The woman is Israel and becomes the church. Now you say, Pastor, how do you know that? You just make these things up? Well... I hope not. <laughs> but you, you will recall as we've gone through this, we've made note that there's nothing new in the book of Revelation. Everything we see here is a further explanation of things rooted in the Old Testament. Mostly and some in the New. So let's look here for just a moment at this woman. She's clothed, clothed this is verse 1, she's clothed with the sun, with the moon, under her feet, and on her head is a crown of twelve stars. Oh. Well, where have we seen the sun and the moon and twelve before? Well, 
What if we go clear back into the book of Genesis when we find Israel, whose name was changed from Jacob to Israel, and he has how many sons? Twelve. And one of them has a dream, doesn't he? And in his dream, he sees the sun and the moon and the stars bowing down to him. And he tells his dream to his brothers and his parents, and they aren't very pleased. So let's look over here. Genesis chapter 37, verses 9 and 10. I'll just read them for you. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and eleven stars were bowing down to me. But when he told it to his father and to his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I, your mother, and your brothers indeed bow down to you? In other words, he's the sun, the mother's the moon, and the brothers are the stars. That makes the mother who? Israel. Who became the church when Christ came the first time. So, the dragon, Satan, is at war with God's people. Sometimes it's easier to just say God's people instead of Israel and the church because it gets a little confusing. But God's people, whoever they are. The woman is Israel. The people of God the conflict is between Satan and God's people. So when did this war begin? You all know the answer. It began many years before Jacob showed up on the scene, didn't it? It began in Genesis with a fall. And who shows up in the Garden of Eden? Is it the dragon? No, it's the serpent. Same thing. One and the same. And the fall occurs. And what is God's response to the fall? His response, I'm going to give you a good word here. It's a nice big word and you can, you can use it on folks. It's great. It's, there's one verse in the Bible that the, we, theologians have given a specific title to. And the title they've given to that verse is the Proto-Evangelium. And so you can go around saying that proto-evangelium, and if you say it enough times fast enough, people think you're speaking in tongues. So don't do that. But, but anyway, the proto, protos means first, evangelium, good news. The first good news is found in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, and here's what it says. This is God speaking. I will put enmity between you and the woman. The you is the serpent. And between your offspring and her offspring. Now that's all the people that will ever be. There are only two kinds of people, right? The people of God, people not of God, or the people of Satan. You remember Jesus in John, when he was, was uh, talking to the Pharisees? He said, you do not believe because you are of your father, the devil. Okay. Only two kinds of people. I will put enmity between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Now what he's saying there is, Satan will bruise the heel of the church. He's going to dog us and harass us and beat us up and poke us and gouge us and trip us and all those things. But eventually there's going to come a time when God says that's it. And that's the end of Satan. The time hasn't come yet. But it's coming and we can know that with absolute confidence. Now, you say, well, how, do, do we see this? This enmity between God's people and Satan's people? Yes. Yes, Satan continues all through history to try to destroy God's people. And where does he begin? Again, right in Genesis, what happens right after uh, Eve has a couple of kids? Cain kills Abel. Abel's the son of promise. Cain, not the son of promise. And, and Satan says, ah, I've won the first round. I killed Abel. Oh, but then Seth is born. Now he's frustrated again, and Seth becomes the son of promise. And you can go right through the Old Testament, you know, and see the old, Ishmael and Isaac. 
Two sons, one son of promise, one not. Uh, Esau and Jacob, Edom and Israel, Saul and David. Why does Saul hate David so much? Well, you say because Saul was egotistical and jealous and all that. Yeah, that's the cause. But what's the proximate cause behind him? Satan. And if Satan can get Saul to kill David, he stymied God's plan. But of course we know it didn't work. So from the fall, God's people have been the expectant mother whom the dragon makes war against. Now, make no mistake, the dragon is a formidable foe. And, and we see in his description here uh, that he has, uh, well, let's just read it. A great red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven diadems. That is trying to show us how powerful and formidable he really is. He has great wisdom. He has great power. He has great cunning and influence. And now look at uh, verse 5. She gave birth to a male child. Oh, Satan says, Haha, I'm, I'm about to win this round because I'm going to devour this child. I'll take care of that. So he has the child nailed to a cross. Now, that's not written in our narrative here, but that's what happens, isn't it? And he's going to kill Jesus. And he's nailed to a cross, died, and was buried. This is a Westminster confession says. And Satan says, I've won. Day one goes by. Day two goes by. I've won. He's dead. Day three goes by and what happens? God snatches him up to heaven. That's the language used in our verse today. Once again, Satan is frustrated. He's foiled. So what does he do? With his plot to destroy the Messiah foiled, the dragon turns his rage on the mother. Now he's trying to put this in, in human terms. And you think about it. If you had been trying to accomplish something for six, eight, ten thousand years, however long, and you were frustrated again and again and again and again and again, you'd be pretty upset. And you would funnel that rage somewhere. Now, Satan knows he can't go one-on-one -on -one with God. One of the reasons he's such a formidable foe is he's smart. So what does he do? He goes for us. Exactly right. But we see the great protection of God in that he pulls Jesus right out of there and up to heaven. And then we see that the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God in which she will be kept safe and nourished for how long? 1,260 days. This time period we keep seeing again and again and again, which is representative of the time between the first and second comings of Jesus Christ. So yes, we see the tribulation, we see the war, we see the battle, but we also see that God is faithful and that we can trust in Jesus. end of story. But now we're going to see the same story from a heavenly perspective. Verses 7 through 12. Now war arose in heaven. Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought back. But he was defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. And he was thrown down to earth and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a voice, a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down. Who accuses them day and night before our God? And they have conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. For they love not their lives even unto death. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to you on the earth and sea. For the devil has come down to you in great wrath because he knows that his time is short. Well, what do we see here? We see Michael and the angels 
fighting against Satan. Satan loses, and they throw him down from heaven. What, what's our time frame now? The cross. The cross. This isn't the primeval fall where Satan was cast out of heaven uh, for coming up against God. This is where he's cast out of heaven, period. You remember if you read in the Old Testament, what do we see in, in, in at least three or four places? The most uh, well-known is in Job. What does Satan do? He presents himself before God to accuse Job. So before the cross, for whatever reason, again, we're not told the why here, God allowed Satan access to himself. And Satan would come before God and accuse God's people. But now, at the cross, that's all over with. At the cross, he's cast out permanently. No more. You've probably all heard, in one form or another, that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. And he stands before God and accuses us of things. And then our advocate Jesus defends us. Or some will have the Holy Spirit defending us. And he always wins the case because he's like Perry Mason. Okay? That's not a biblically accurate picture. Satan is not accusing us of anything. He has no access to God. He's kicked out. He's disbarred. He's done. At the cross, he was finished. And he knows it, which makes him even more dangerous to us. So this battle resulting in Satan's expulsion from heaven took place at the cross. And now deprived of any authority to indict believers and knowing his days are numbered, Satan turns all of his energy, all his frustration on the church. That's what it looked like from heaven. But before we finish, we have to just a couple more verses here. We're told, given a little more information in verses 13 through 17 about this whole scenario. And when the dragon saw that he had been thrown down to the earth, he pursued the woman. Where did the woman go? Into the wilderness, remember? He pursues her. The woman who had given birth to the male child. But the woman was given two wings of the great eagle so that she might fly from the serpent into the wilderness to the place where she is to be nourished for, here we go again, a time, times, and a half a time. Our same time period again, different phraseology. The serpent poured water like a river out of his mouth after the woman to sweep her away with a flood. But the earth came to the help of the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed the river that the dragon had poured from his mouth. Then the dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring, on those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. And he stood on the sand and the sea. Again, we see this motif. Satan is making war against the woman's offspring. That's you and I and all believers for all time. It's interesting that this takes place in the wilderness. Now, if God wants to preserve the woman, why doesn't he just put her in a nice, well-furnished castle or something? I don't know why. But again, if we look through biblical history, where do we often find God's people? In the wilderness. Where did, where, where did they wander for 40 years during the Exodus? In the wilderness. Where do we find Elijah? In the wilderness. And it's not a pleasant place. But what does God do with his people in the wilderness? He preserves them, doesn't he? And that's the idea of these eagle wings. It's God picking her up, taking care of her, shepherding her, if you will. The dragon tries his best to destroy her. But he can't do it. So he gets frustrated. And, and in verse 15, we see that out of the dragon's mouth comes this flood. Now that's weird, isn't it? 
What would you expect to come out of the dragon's mouth? Fire. There's water. What, what's the deal with that? The deal with that is this. It's a subtle attack. It's not a physical attack. It's, it's not an attack where uh, the government or whatever comes against the church. This is a subtle attack where he comes inside the church. And he does the same thing he did in the Garden of Eden. He says, has God really said? Remember that was his approach to Eve in the Garden? And so he comes to us, to you and to I, and he says, come on. Now do you really believe all this stuff? Do you really think that happened? And then he'll modify it a little bit and he'll say, you know, there you go again. Are you really a Christian? And you did that? And then he'll have pastors and we'll say things like, not me personally and not the good ones, but some pastors will say things like, well, you know, this is a really good book and it's got some good stuff in it, but it's not necessarily the Word of God. And so that he subtly destroys the church by destroying sound doctrine. And he almost succeeded, didn't he? Didn't he? In, in the 1400s, 1500s, the church was pretty much neutered. It was pretty much impotent. Thank God for the Reformation. But see, again, God looked out for the church. He sent men like Martin Luther and John Calvin and, and those guys. And they reformed the church and they went back to God's Word as their foundation. And that's how, I, I, when it says the earth saved, opened their mouth and saved the woman, I think that's exactly what he's referring to. Every time the church almost falls off the biblical bandwagon, so to speak, there's somebody there to catch her. God will raise up somebody and preserve his church. The fight continues today and the fight will continue until Jesus Christ returns. So why do bad things happen to good people? Because we're under siege by the dragon. And you know, having this in mind, it, it sort of brings out what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, a little more vividly, doesn't it? For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. And what Paul's saying here he is, he says, don't just look at the cause, the proximate cause, look at the cause behind the cause. See, so we wrestle not against fresh flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities and against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, against spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places, spiritual places. So the next time somebody's just really getting to you, giving you a bad time, saying bad things about you, or whatever it is, try to look beyond that person and say, it's, it's not really a battle with them. It's a battle of my spirit with the spirit that is compelling them. And it makes it a little easier to sort it out. It still doesn't make it easy, but it makes it a little easier. So we have this promise from Jesus himself. The church will never perish. No matter how long he tarries, the church will never perish. No matter how bleak it looks, the church will never perish. Why? Because what did Jesus say? I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Okay? So we're going to have good times and bad. The church is going to go from times of sound doctrine to weak doctrine. But in all that, God is going to preserve it. And so he will with you. Your life is going to be full of good times and bad times. And he never says that he will keep us from physical violence or physical ill. But he does promise that he will keep us from spiritual destruction. Satan cannot touch you because you're God's. And you're sealed by the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. So physically the trip may be hell on earth. <laughs> but spiritually we're already in heaven. That's huge. That's tremendous. You need to know that. So there is a picture of the whole battle, the whole deal. 
And that's really what the book of Revelation is. It's a picture from the beginning to the end with all the bumps, all the struggles, all the hard times. But God wins. And when God wins, his people win. And that's us. And nothing can take us out of the hand of God. That's great, isn't it? And so, we can indeed say, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." But it's easier said than done. So, let's just ask Him to help us. Father, thank You so much for uh, this picture. It's graphic, it's vivid, Lord. It's a little bit scary. And yet, uh, You have promised to keep us. You've told us that You will not lose a single one. That we'll all be there with You one day. And so, God, we do trust in you, and yet, like the fellow in the New Testament said to you, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And Father, that would be my prayer this morning, and I'm sure it could be echoed by all the others here. Lord, we believe, help our unbelief. Lord, fill us with your Holy Spirit to the point where regardless of what happens, we can trust in you. I think of another old hymn, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And Lord, give us that picture that, that when we are assaulted, accosted, molested, that we can lean back into your arms and know that you are there. Know that though we are in the wilderness, you will make a way for us through the wilderness. In the words of Isaiah, that when we go through troubled waters, we will not drown. When we go through the fire, we will not be burned up. Those are your words to us. And so, O oh God, embolden us to live our lives in a way that reflects you. And now, Lord, as we go to communion, help us to clear our minds and focus on you. In Jesus' name, amen.